Alright, shut up! <laughs> Alright, so let's talk about the scoop with this class. This is 325, right? Yeah. Alright, so for starters, remember all those times that I made you do uh, number conversion and hexadecimal, all that stuff? And you're going to hope you learned about that because this whole class is about what's underneath the hood. So all those times that we talked about, hey, it's important to know what's underneath the hood and let's talk about it. Everything's underneath the hood in this class. So um, uh, now a couple of people in here are also taking the class tonight, right? Okay. So first of all, let me just so I don't forget, don't buy the book twice. That'll make sense to you shortly. Huh? I'm going to be talking about the book. Oh. <laughs> Don't buy it twice. All right. Um, so in any case, because um, this class and that class overlap for the first like 20%, but we're going to use the same book for part of that. Um, okay. So for starters, we're going to do things a little bit different this semester where the department is working towards something called ABIT accreditation, which uh, actually that makes your degree worth more. We look better on paper, blah, blah, blah. So because of that, we had to incorporate some stuff into some of our classes. And one of them is a textbook. Yeah. And uh, I have even worse news. Yeah, well, I, I don't think it's like overly, overly priced. But because it's an interactive textbook that's also a bit accredited, if you were to acquire a PDF, that doesn't exist. That's, I guess, what I'm saying. It's a whole... We have to be able to like measure it for our assessment. Yeah, it's it's a, you you are gonna actually have to buy the book. Yeah. No, I under I get it. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> but it actually is a, a pretty a pretty good book, and we'll kind of go through it here in a few minutes. So you'll have actually um, it's like an interactive thing. So let's talk about the course and overview and that kind of jazz first, and then we'll introduce the book and some of the other stuff. All right, so uh, course should be live now, I think, on Blackboard as of maybe like a half hour ago, something like that. Um, all right, so if you go in there and we go to uh, uh, course info and resources, uh, we'll come back to this assembly language tutorial uh, here shortly. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you uh, uh, enjoy programming? Okay, so, so how many of you hate programming? Two and a half people. So, uh, so you know how like you think Java is hard? For those of you that hate programming. So Java is a high level language, right? So high level languages, so remind me, what's a high level language? Compared to a low level language. Okay. Many to one. Many to one. So high level language is a many to one relationship. So every line of code we write in a high level language like Java translates into a whole bunch of instructions in a low level language like assembly. So that one line hello world program in assembly is more than one line. Well, we're going to write assembly in here. So you think you hated high level programming. Wait till I put you in a room alone with a CPU and say, talk to it one-to-one -one basis. Okay. Um, whole, new, um, uh, uh, whole new experience, but it's, it's actually quite interesting, but uh, this kind of goes along with this theme of uh, we're learning about what's under the hood. How do computers actually work? You know, how does our operating system actually talk to the hardware components? Um, so all the other courses you've had to this point have always danced above that hardware line, right? You know, we've always talked about higher level interfaces to lower level stuff. Well, now we're going to be talking about the actual lower level stuff. All right, so let's look at the syllabus first. All right, so my usual rigmarole. Here's the description, blah, 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 that may or may not be meaningful. Um, we meet at this time in this class, uh, blah, blah, blah. Grade breakdown, homework assignments, 45% of your grade, 
Pop quizzes, 15% of your grade. Um, midterm final each 20%. My normal policy where if you bomb the midterm and you do better in the final, I'll replace your midterm exam grade with whatever you get in the final, but not the other way around. So you can't ace the midterm, get a zero in the final, and expect a hundred on the final. I'll only, if you've proven to me you've learned more by the end, I'll help you along with the midterm. Are they? Oh. Well, that's when I'm going to be here. It's 10:05, so, so I'm just, I am here for another class. So you, I'm just, I'm trying to compress. Just me. Um, okay. So in any case, we'll. we'll can we agree to meet at this this time? <laughs> we met at 10.05 yesterday. Um, a day early, it was a thing. Um, all right, normal grading scale, blah, blah, blah. Um, so uh, quizzes uh, will always be right at the beginning of class when I decide to have a quiz. The proverbial take out a piece of paper uh, will occur. Uh, it's, I say relatively often. The main purpose of that is to A, make sure that you are listening in class and reviewing the content from the previous course before class. Uh, and also, I tend to always give quizzes when attendance is low uh, as a means to punish those who skip. Um, so, something to keep in mind. Uh, so, always make a habit of reviewing what we did the previous class in the event that we might have a quiz in a... Uh, the beginning of class and try to come to class on time because you'll miss the quiz in the first five minutes and then we'll laugh at you. Um, well, I will. So, all right, questions about the course in terms of syllabus, blah, blah, blah. We're good? All right, so let's go into assignments here before we talk about the other stuff. As usual, so here's our you must read homework submission instructions. So I'm going to click on that. So this is our usual self-assessment thing, but I also have a couple other things in here. So self-assessment template, this guy down here. Every single assignment that you submit should have these four questions answered and pasted into the submission text box with it. Okay. How long did you spend on the assignment? Based on your effort, what do you think you deserve? Based on what you turned in. In terms of the solution, what do you think you deserve? And most importantly, this last one, tell me what doesn't work and tell me about your experience. If you spent 10 hours on the assignment and you have crap to show for it, this is your opportunity to tell me what you went through so that I can give you some partial credit. Make sense? It's going to be even more important in here than in some other classes, um, especially when we are into the, to the assembly language stuff, because you might spend a long time trying to come up with the right... Uh, a uh, collection of gibberish to feed the CPU and literally have nothing to show for it. Like nothing. So you're, you probably, I should get like several paragraphs in this, this section here for, for that if you want points. Uh, if you don't want points, then you feel free to, well, I guess if you don't want any points, you don't even have to submit this. But if you don't turn in a self-evaluation, I don't care what else you turned in, the homework's a zero. I usually have been known to sometimes give a first-time warning when you forget to do it, okay, but no promises. Always turn this in. Even if the homework was easy, just say, you know, I spent five minutes, A for effort, A for solution, homework was easy, done, That's fine. Make it a habit of always turning this in. Questions? Will that ever happen to you? Well, easy homework? No, 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 I don't think so. Yeah. I don't know, maybe early on there might be. You know, like yesterday, I gave a pretty easy assignment to to this class yesterday when we met. Um, let's see, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. So here's, this is something new for this semester. Uh, I'm actually saying it this time, so it's like officially, contractually, blah, 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 whatever. You cannot turn crap in late, all right, um, unless it's a true emergency, you know, death in the family, that kind of stuff. Legit, okay, those are, you know, you don't have to worry about it. Email me when you can and say, hey, stuff went down. I'm not going to get the homework in. I'll get it to you when I can. Fine. I'm not going to be a jerk about it, okay? But if you um, had an unexpected late shift at work, that's not an excuse. Um, 
I get it that real life starts earlier for folks these days, but from my perspective, you're full-time students. Um, and work isn't an excuse. So I get you got to do what you got to do to pay your bills and all that jazz, but you're full-time students from my perspective. So um, that's kind of the, the, the deal. So uh, if you choose not to turn homework in on time, that's fine. You're adults. You make your own decisions. You get a zero in it. And that zero will be part of the average that goes into 45% of your grade. Um, not the best idea, be my opinion. You probably should try to turn in all your homework. Uh, even if it's only half done, turn something in. Um, but always on time. If it's late, I'm just going to give you a zero in it. Probably won't even look at it because I get a little flag that says it was late. I'll just give you the zero and I'll probably say something funny or something like that. Um, all right, questions about that? All right, so uh, that also includes sports stuff. So if uh, uh, sports does not excuse you from homework assignments. Now, if you have an excused absence for, uh, uh, you know, where your team has to travel somewhere or whatever, so whatever and you've been excused, that'll get you out of a quiz. So I'll just omit you from that quiz so it doesn't, you don't get a free hundred, you just, it won't hurt you. You just, it's as if that quiz doesn't exist for you. Um, so that's a reasonable excuse uh, if you have to miss class because of an excused absence related to, you know, band or a sport, something like that. But uh, not for homework assignments. Any questions? What, what happened? Bad things? Oh. Are you sure I didn't just like bump it? I probably bumped it. Oh, nailed it. This projector seems better. It really does. It's new. I think it's the whole thing is new. I was told this morning it's it's the same remote though, or at least looks like the same remote. Um, all right. So questions about any of that? So we're not going to have any late homework, or at least if you turn it in late, you're not going to whine about your zero. But I do enjoy giving zeros, so I mean, makes sense. Well, actually, I do actually enjoy the whining, but it's not going to get you anywhere. I guess is what I'm saying. I, I do. I like. Gro I like groveling. Huh? Well, not grade wise. Um, Somewhere in my head, I guess, if like you're like borderline and you like really have had a breakdown, you know, like a public display of, you know, you just lost it. I might give you the benefit of the doubt. So I just got to really sell it. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to be beyond selling it. It has to be real. Okay. So <laughs> that's actually happened before. Really? Oh, yeah. And it's always the guys, 100% of the time. So this is my 18th year teaching, and uh, and it's usually during final exam week. And you just have guys just have these meltdowns. One time it was a football player, this big tough guy, just lost it. Now I'm sitting there trying not to laugh. <laughs> you like nailed the difficulty for this class. <laughs> And I didn't try very hard. I was, I was like giggling. I, I sort of felt bad for a second. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so that's that. So everybody will turn in your self-assessment stuff with your homework. So let's go back into this. So now let's look at the textbook. So the textbook's actually an online book. It's from a place called zybooks.com. Um, so you'll go to zybooks.com and you'll have to, you'll subscribe to the book. You put in uh, this link, CSUWCS325 in fall 2016, and that will get you linked to the right class. Um, if you're taking the evening class tonight, uh, I would say t uh, get the book for this class, but don't buy it twice. It's the same. They're identical. <laughs> All right, so in any case, the book will end up looking like this once you've subscribed to it. Looks, it look, costs is eighty two dollars. It looks like, right? So that's the that's the book. 
Uh, but hey, remember your degree means more now because of the 8-bit accreditation stuff. It's, it's totally legit. Wait, you already have the accreditation? We're going to have it at the end of this uh, end of this year. Yeah, it'll be, it'll look like it, yeah. Even, yeah. Though, even though we only have a year on this. Yeah, totally. It's <laughs> grandfathered in. <laughs> grandfathered in. Um, all right, so anyways, the um, so as an example, here's like chapter one, and we're going to start kind of working through some of this stuff today, but we're I'm actually going to use a different resource for what we're going to start talking about today. Um, but just to give you an idea of what the, the book kind of looks like, um, I'll... We don't really need to zoom in too much, but you read through some stuff, and then there's like interactive quizzes, and when you fill out these quizzes, that gets linked to the students, so then we have assessment information, which is what the ABET accreditation people then use, so. Uh, it's not going to be graded in terms of, uh, um, I'll probably give like homework assignment to read chapter one. So what I would then, uh, it probably won't be a graded activity, but I would then expect to see Everybody has 100%, like I could run a report and see that everybody's gone through the material. You know, it's not going to show me that you've got a two out of three on this quiz because you can answer it multiple times until you get it right. But more like it's assessing that students have seen the material and, and done it, that type of stuff. So there won't be homework from the book. Uh, there might be homework from the book because there is also exercises from the book, but the uh, um, this is more interactive learning type stuff. Um, so that's... Uh, one thing new this semester. Another thing new this semester, and uh, this is going to be difficult for me, but uh, hopefully I can somehow pull it off, is we're going to try to break the class up into part hands-on during class and then part lecture, rather than it just being a straight hour and 15 minutes of lecture. Um, part of that is um, uh, also for the accreditation stuff, but... Uh, um, we're doing de department assessment stuff and different learning styles we're exploring. So uh, something we're hoping to do is, and this is re like related to what I've always done kind of for the homework assignments where I've encouraged uh, for homework, people work together. So create study groups, blah, blah, blah. If you're, you know, feel like you're weaker in the subject, get together with some stronger people in the subject. The stronger people become better by helping teach uh, the weaker folks, the weaker folks become better by kind of hearing the material from a different direction than what they're just hearing from me. Well, we're going to try to bring some of that into the actual classroom time period, which might mean we end up getting through less total material, um, but hopefully the material you get, you get, you'll understand better. So we'll try to do some in-class activities where we might break up into uh, small groups for 10 or 15 minutes or something like that and do some small something or other. So we'll, we'll see how that's pretty, I don't know, it's not really my style, but I'm going to try. So, so, so we'll see what, we'll see what happens. Um, it's going to be easier for the grad course because I can just take a nap and say, okay, for two hours, you guys, I don't know, do sit-ups or something. And then uh, I might do that. All right. So anyways, that's the, uh, uh, the textbook. I'm going to assume everybody will have this uh, by Thursday. I'm not going to give you anything out of the book for today, but I'll assume everybody will get the book uh, by Thursday and, and, and have it. Um, okay, so questions on that. Go ahead. Well, it's an online version of the textbook. Correct, yeah. And, and I would even say that it's, it's not even really just a book. It's kind of like an online interactive Science. thing, yeah, that's linked to assessment. So, yeah, and so there's, it's, it's, it's like a double, it's almost like a double negative whammy because A, you subscribe to it and I think you lose access to it like at the end of the year or something like that. Yeah, so, so you don't even get to keep the material. I guess you, I mean, you probably can, I don't know, try to take screen captures or, or something. I, I don't know. I'm sure there's a way. Um, but the assessment stuff is a big deal, and so we'll see. Um, you'll have an opportunity at the end of the semester to give me some uh, feedback. Actually, during the semester, too, we're going to do a couple of different assessment things. But you'll have an opportunity to give me some true feedback about the book and was it better, was it worse, whatever. It actually is good. I'm using it for all my classes this semester. Um, 
Zybooks? Zybooks, yep. Uh, so like I said, it's, it's, I'm interested in it from because I'm trying to change some of my teaching style stuff, I, I guess. Um, so it's, it goes against my natural tendencies. So it's kind of puts me in an uncomfortable position. We started this last semester. So, um, uh, and we tried to incorporate, we didn't do it in the classroom, but behind the scenes in, in some of our upper division classes, like, like 450 last semester, which didn't really go well for me. I, it just was a I know, very disorganized for me. I'm used to kind of just shooting from the hip rather than having this trail. Or, yeah, so yeah, she's it's weird. So, so so we'll see what happens. So hopefully, having a tool like this is uh, almost like a paint by number will be beneficial uh, for all of us. All right. Uh, any other questions about the book? Okay. Um, so now let's go here. And um, so we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and bring up the assembly language tutorial. Uh, let me go ahead and give you your kind of official, it's a very weird page. Oh, whatever, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's and it's like a resizing. Oh, it seemed like somewhere in there it. Uh, I assume you can all read that. <laughs> That's good. Huh. Um. Yeah, I think if I go any bigger, it ends up starting to get smaller. Oh, I guess that. I guess we can work it that way. That's probably, that's probably the way to do it. Um, okay, so we're going to be working through this uh, um, tutorial throughout the first eight weeks. So we're going to kind of be mixing in stuff from this with stuff from the textbook and then some other stuff. Um, so everything from here is about writing software in assembly language. So let me take a few minutes to kind of introduce that, and then we're going to talk about computer organization and architecture kind of in general. Um, so let me just kind of scroll down here. Um, so we've looked at this before, and one of the reasons I like using this tutorial point thing is they actually have a built-in assembler, so you can do it actually all online rather than setting up your own environment for it. Um, and there's some complexity actually with that, and I'll, I'll kind of talk about it as we go as we go through this. But uh, let's see if I can make this even. Can we see that pretty good? Is that big enough? We can all see that. All right. So uh, let's talk a little bit about um, assembly language. So when we write in a low level language like assembly language, and let me get the presentation thing kind of open here so we can babble about it on there. go here. So when we talk about assembly language, this guy's a low-level language. So that's a one-to-one -one relationship with the CPU. And remember when we originally introduced the CPU in one of your other classes with me, we kind of talk about the CPU in terms of the magic tricks it can do, right? So we think about a CPU as being able to do let's say a hundred different magic tricks. And each one of these magic tricks is in and of itself not that impressive because they need to be granular enough to help solve a large set of problems, but they need to be powerful enough that you can actually accomplish something without writing four zillion lines of code. There's some sort of balance in there. And when new, when, you know, when, when this year's Core i7 processor comes out compared to last year's Core i7 processor. It's the newest architecture, and a lot of times what they do is they get more magic tricks onto the processor. So let's think of for a minute about the nature uh, of a processor. So what we want to do is we want to think about a computer processor is, is kind of like a, let's bounce back here real quick. Think of it like a neighborhood. Let's just do CPU. 
Right, so in the early days of building society, let's say, our, uh, the, the means by which we built stuff was uh, uh, not as high tech as we have today. We were kind of breaking stones apart and piling them on top of each other and things like that. We could probably fit. Uh, we weren't that efficient with our living space. Make sense? All right, so over the years, as we've become better at building houses and building communities and things like that, we've been able to squeeze more people into the same amount of space. All right, um, the, the kings of this is, is in Japan, right? They, they just went up. <laughs> so they just started building skyscrapers and just put people in there. So I think, uh, I think Tokyo has the biggest uh, population density in the world for a single city. It's like something ridiculous. Um, but uh, in any case, we've gotten better and better at fitting more stuff into a smaller or at least the same space over the years. Processors are the same way. When we go back to, well, early, early, early computers where a computer was the size of a gymnasium, uh, we didn't have integrated circuits. We didn't have transistors. So we didn't have some of our uh, modern little tricks for miniaturizing hardware. And when we talk about computer hardware, a, a decent way of maybe thinking about it is software created with wires. So computer hardware and computer programming are related, except computer programming is done with the keyboard and characters on the screen, and then a piece of software translates it into something the CPU understands, where creating computer hardware, that programming is done with a soldering iron and wires, historically. More recently, it's done with very large-scale integration with uh, uh, like printers that actually print wires onto the you know a silicon circuit board, that kind of thing. Well, uh, if you've ever bought like a a laptop and, and looked real closely at some of the specs, and this is most common in laptops, sometimes you'll see something um, uh, like it'll be uh, 0.28 micron. Uh, Core i5 processor. Anybody seen anything like that before? Where it gives a measurement in microns? What does that mean? Okay. Yep. So it's the technology used to create that chip. The lower the amount of microns, the closer the wires are, you know, those printed wires I just mentioned, the closer those guys are to each other on the actual processor. Now, most of what we see as the processor is about heat dissipation. What we look at is that chip. Very little of that is the physical space of the processor. Most of that is how do I get heat away from this thing? All right, so the processor usually referred to as the die. is somewhere, a you know, little tiny thing in there, but we can fit a whole bunch of stuff in it when we have these, you know, 0.21 micron, uh, 0.18 micron technologies to the point where any closer and the wires start interfering with each other at the atomic level, all right? This is our evolution of our, of, of our hardware. We're, we're getting really, really, really good at putting a lot, cramming a lot of stuff into the same physical space as uh, we historically have. How many of you have built your own computer? I think everybody who's gone through 175 at least had that, that experience at some level, right? So when you, in 175, you had a, processor. What did you guys get? Like Core i3s or something like that? Core i5s? Okay, so, and you know, processor was what? Kind of like like that big? Something something like that? That's to scale. <laughs> and how big do you think the processors are going to be this year? Same size. How many, how big do you think they'll be next year? Probably the same size. You can't maybe go too much farther than that because we're, I think we're right on the cusp of a change. Uh, probably somewhat somewhat soon. But from a physical perspective, from a human being's concept of physical size, processors have been the exact same size for a long time. So a Pentium processor from 10 years ago physically would be the same size as a Pentium processor today. Physically. Uh, over that time period, they've had more pins coming out of the bottom of the processors. Uh, years and years and years ago, you might have a processor there. Might, you might have been able to put your finger in between the pins. Uh, today, you can't do that, really. You know, today, uh, you, know, you might not even be able to push the individual pins into jello. They would probably push it as one fell. They're so close to each other that uh, um, it's almost like a, like a brush right? <laughs> on the bottom. But the, um, 
The point is the physical real estate that a processor takes up today is the same as it's been for years. But there's more stuff on that processor today than there has ever been because we can fit more stuff in the same physical space. We've also got better at heat dissipation. Um, that actually becomes kind of an interesting, uh, kind of a global discussion we can have regarding um, um, if you, what's the maximum processor speed of a, of a computer today? If you were to build a, the fastest Core i7 you can find, what's the maximum clock speed? 4. 4.5, that's probably the turbo speed of it. It's probably like a, what, a 3.8 uh, turbo to 4.5 or something like that. Somewhere in that, that ballpark. Okay, what was it four years ago? Pretty similar, right? We haven't seen large changes in the maximum clock speed of our uh, processors in, in a while. Um, now, having said that, what does clock speed mean? Is faster clock speed better? Is a 2.5 gigahertz processor faster than a 2.3 gigahertz processor always? What's a gigahertz? What does that mean? What does clock speed mean? All right, what's a cycle? Okay. I, I think that's a pretty... At an abstract level, it's a pretty fair answer. Yeah. Do you have something to add? Yeah, that's completely wrong. That answer has already been given. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, so now we're, we're, we're probably getting more accurate uh, with that. So when we start thinking about under the hood, what all happens to go from software to telling the hardware what to do. We're dealing with fetching a hardware instruction and decoding it and doing stuff with it and ultimately having the processor figuring out um, who needs to be involved in terms of the other parts of the computer, memory and stuff like that. You know, it's almost like the processor's your quarterback. Who needs to be involved in this play? And then, boom, execute it. Okay, and we'll, we're going to look at the Hello World program here in a, in a second and kind of see how this uh, plays out a little bit. So there's a lot of things that all happen there under the hood. But when we think just about clock speed, um, you want to think about it in terms of the maximum capability of things that can happen within a period of time. He said something about number of cycles. Okay, so we sometimes use this phrase cycles like generically, you know. A single CPU cycle is kind of that, that single fetch, decode, execute combo. Okay, it's the minimum amount of time that a processor can throw a punch. Let's say something like that. Okay, and I'm trying to keep things as kind of generalistic as possible. We're going to get a lot uh, uh, more detailed about it throughout the semester. But um, kind of the punchline is we, we tend to measure things at the abstract level in terms of cycles. All right, so... Faster clock speed equals theoretical faster cycles. But a faster clock speed does not necessarily mean that processor is faster. Because just because we're doing things more often, the capability of that processor might be less. Or what you can accomplish in a single cycle might not be as powerful. Okay, so when this year's Pentium Core i7 processor comes out. Um, it's a superset of last year's uh, Pentium Core i7 because we figured out how to fit a little bit more stuff on the chip. All right, so between last year and this year, our technology's gotten a little bit better, so we are able to squeeze the houses a little bit closer together. So we've created this nice little plot of land somewhere on the chip that we didn't have available to us before. So that's a place where we can put more crap, okay? Um, so now twisting this back to what we were talking about earlier when I said programming versus hardware are kind of the same thing, but one is done with the keyboard and, and characters. The other one is done with the soldering iron and wires, all right? So both of those are kind of the same kind of thing. It's, it's programming logic. It's, it's computer logic. 
So the stuff that we're going to put in that newfound real estate on the chip that we have now, we now have room for is going to be more circuits. Well, what's a circuit? When I say circuit, what does that mean to you? Okay, path for electricity to travel. I, I, I mean, I, I think that's completely accurate. Tell me a little bit more about how that electricity travels. Well, like a heater on or off. Okay. So that'll tell the communication heater what to do depending if the electricity is on or off. Uh, okay. Um, so a circuit has an entry point and an exit point. It might have multiple exit points, right? Because it might be hooked up to, it might also have multiple entry points. But just in a simple case, we're going to say a circuit has one entry point and maybe three <laughs> exit points. Electricity comes in on one side and is going to go through a journey between the entry point and the exit point. And during that journey, this electricity is flowing. It's going to run into various obstacles. All right. Okay. So we're going to call them obstacles. I heard somebody say gates. Okay. It's going to run into and gates or gates, things that should start sounding like the Boolean logic that we've used in conjunction with our if statements. Loops, conditionals, those guys. What's a Boolean expression? Any expression that boils down to a single value of true or false, right? So um, in digital logic, we have the same thing. But instead of writing the double ampersand, you know, for and in Java, we have a little tiny little circuit thing called a gate. Okay, And that gate has, for a and or an or, has two inputs, one output. Sometimes that output's on, sometimes that output's off. So the AND gate either blocks or it doesn't block the electricity. So if you have electricity flowing through the circuit and all of a sudden it hits an AND gate, okay, and you're going to have two inputs, so you have two different, two different paths of electricity, they both hit this AND gate, only if both of those paths of electricity was on, power, we power both sides, does electricity come out the other side. Make sense? All right, so it's almost like a, a puzzle. Okay, where, where electricity, electricity is flowing through it, it keeps hitting all these little obstacles. And depending on the obstacle, it banks this way, or it banks this way, or it banks this way, or it just completely stops here. And in the end, we're monitoring the output. Okay, maybe there's two or three or four output pins. And those are all zeros or ones that say on or off. And some of them are going to be on, some of them are going to be off, because potentially the electricity got stopped somewhere in here by one of those gates or combination of gates, things like that. Okay, and the more complex the problem we're trying to solve at the hardware level, the more gates that are gonna be involved. Make sense? All right, so, and software programming is kind of the same thing. We, we typically don't think about it like that because we're not uh, usually thinking about it as terms in terms of the flow of electricity, but it's really the same thing. We take user input and that flows through this mousetrap that is our, uh, uh, our computer program, and depending on our logic, ultimately we get a different result, depending on what the inputs were, right? So it's the same thing, but one of them we did with a, well, historically we did with a soldering iron. Um, now we do it with a 3D printing thing, or you know, in here we'll do it with like a little simulator, <laughs> simulator type thing. Um, but you know, punchline is, is that these guys aren't different. They just seem different. Okay, software is the um, kind of the convenient way for us to create circuits. Now, having said that, so do we? Do, do you? Um, are there any questions about that? That high-level difference between a digital circuit board and a piece of software like a Java program? Do we kind of get the high-level difference between those? All right. So um, now, even though some of you said you uh, hate programming. Can we all agree that it's more convenient to sit down in front of a keyboard and type a couple of Java commands or do a Google search and copy and paste <laughs> some stuff and then hit play than it is to sit down with a soldering iron and uh, um, a bunch of things and start messing with wires and stuff like that? So it's more convenient to work in software, right? Okay, how many of you have ever soldered anything? Okay, how many of you consider yourself good at soldering? They make it look so easy on TV. Like I see the, the show How It's Made. 
You seen that show? Like, <laughs> you simply solder. And they, you know, they put the flux on and they heat this one thing up and they put the solder on and and it like it's like perfect seal all around it. Okay, I basically close off all, the entire circuit. I just have solder dripping everywhere. Okay, to the point where if I even want to like salvage what I've done, I have to just heat the whole thing up and just drip it off. Just hope, right? Um, and then they they expect that. Um, so here, let's let's deal with uh, ethical computing for a few minutes. One of my favorite topics. Um, <laughs> sure. Any of you play Pokemon Go? I've been banned. I've been banned from that like five times, huh? I do. I have one. I've been I've been botting sparingly. <laughs> oh yeah. Necrobot. Yeah. Still working. Ish. I don't have time to play it myself. That's, that's why we have technology to play these games for us, right? My first account got banned at level thirty-five. Well, that's because it's like humanly impossible to get to before like four months from now. I was cleaning it up at the Olympic Village in Brazil. <laughs> All right. So, in any, that was I, I, that actually wasn't the example I was going for. I said ethical computing. Or the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, we've heard of uh, this idea of like modding an Xbox or modding a PlayStation, that kind of stuff, right? And and or, or jailbreaking an iPhone or um, root, rooting an Android device. This kind of stuff. Most of it today is done in software, right? There's various software tricks to, to pull this stuff off. And have, have any of you ever had to, well, not that any of you would ever modify a piece of hardware to make it uh, do something for free. Um, but just out of curiosity, have any of you any, ever known anybody who modified a, uh, a device um, that required some solder? Okay. Um, so... The original Nintendo Wii to, uh, had a copy protection. So let's just, we're going to kind of talk about a real-life kind of case study for hardware. It had a copy protection thing that wouldn't allow you to make a copy of the disc and then play a copy. Okay? Um, because inside the Nintendo Wii is the circuit board, right? And on this circuit board is the whole bunch of little programs, little circuits that we've been talking about here. And one of these little circuits that everything had to run through when you tried to play a disc was the one that detected whether or not it was a burned disc or an original, okay? So think of that like a gate. It wasn't an AND gate, it wasn't an OR gate, it was, is this a, bur is this a burned disc gate, okay? Little circuit that, that checked for that. So to hack that initial uh, original Wii, just to think about this from a generalistic problem, Electricity was going in before that gate, but not coming in after it because of you were running a cheated disk. You were running a disk that you copied. How do you fix that? If you have a gate here in the middle and it's stopping the electricity from coming through here because you've cheated, you know, you're, you're playing a burned disk, how do you fix that so that you can play burned disks? Put a wire over it. Skip this guy. You see, you see, see that move? Right? You, just, you jump it. So, what this <laughs> what this place came out with was a, a little chip, and it had soldering holes, so you, you to keep you from screw. So even I could do it, because you could just spill solder over the top of the thing, and it would just drop into the couple of holes. So basically, you line this thing up, and it had two little holes. One hole was in the contact right before the gate, right before the the are you cheating circuit. The other one was right after it. The are you cheating circuit. So what it would do is it would jump the are you cheating circuit. And then you just dump solder in there and you're done. And it had a little wire that went across to complete that circuit without having to go through the check. Make sense? All right, so usually we can bypass stuff in software today. But just as an example, what we just did there is no different than what some of the bypasses, uh, what happens with some of the bypasses in software today. If you are uh, rooting an Android device, and it's relying on the fact that Android basically runs as a Linux operating system, okay? So now a Linux operating system has its, uh, has kind of some known, known bugs in it, if you will. 
at the very least, you can get root level access to this guy. Okay, and when you have this root level access to this operating system, you can do stuff that you weren't supposed to be able to do with the friendly Android ecosystem. Make sense? When you're running the Android operating system, they're giving you a kind of an interface into the Linux operating system that's protected. You're running as a normal user, not as the super user that can get into trouble. In Windows terms, you know, when you double click on something that says, do you want to run this as administrator? And that means bad things could happen. That's, that's kind of the, the, the deal. So when you root an Android device, you're go effectively saying, I want to have super user privileges at the operating system level. So when I want something to work a certain way, it doesn't block me because I'm more important than the guy trying to block me. And it lets you run third-party software and things like that that allow you to do interesting things with Android. One, it's one of the reasons why a lot of people prefer Android, because you, you have more flexibility with what you could do with the device. On the flip side, with iOS, probably in general, iOS users are more interested in their device just working than kind of hacking it uh, and understanding the hack. That doesn't mean that iOS users don't want to hack their device. They want to jailbreak their device too, but they don't really care what's happening under the hood as a general rule. They just want to... They want to be able to cheat. They want to be able to get free stuff off the app store and all, all that jazz and, you know, be able to share their Wi-Fi connection and you know, whatever, stuff like that. So, but a lot of times we're doing those things through software today, where historically we did that through hardware. And this kind of leads us towards a very popular thing today. We have a, a tool that's kind of a hybrid hardware and software. It's called the programmable microcontroller. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Programmable microcontroller. PMC? Um, I mean, I'm sure you've heard of them before. So you've heard of an Arduino. Um, you've heard of a... Uh, um, technically, a Raspberry Pi would be one, but it's, it's kind of a, just a computer, right? Uh, but what it is, is so a programmable microcontroller is a piece of hardware. It's a, it's a circuit, like we're talking about here. But it's a circuit that's built for general purpose. So rather than the circuit being built to solve a very specific problem, i.e., are you cheating on your Wii, okay? Instead of that little simple circuit that's doing something like that, it's instead a general purpose circuit that has maybe 10 inputs and 10 outputs, and then what it has in the middle is it has a, a, a runtime, a virtual machine that runs software. So it allows you to meld hardware with software. And instead of you having to do all sorts of soldering and things like that, you can write all those gates and things like that in software. Yet you're still hooking wires up here for your inputs. So you're going to run a wire from here to here. You're going to run a wire from here to here. Maybe it's controlling a, a light or something like that. All right. But in between, instead of it being hardware circuits that that electricity is flowing through, electricity is flowing here, flagging an input. Then your software that you wrote in the middle, which is far more flexible, far more, you know, far easier to debug. You know, if you screw up your circuit with solder, what happens? You're back to the melt it all off thing. What was the original solution for, oops, I screwed up my soldering? We had this thing called a, a breadboard. And it was a, a zero insertion force breadboard. So instead of you having to solder onto the breadboard, you could just take the wire and you poke it down in the hole and the, the hole kind of held it. That way, if you needed to change something, you just pulled it out and pushed it back in over here. You had to be real delicate, though. Because, you know, you move that thing around too much, wires start falling out, you don't, don't know where they went. Okay, so it was a prototyping uh, breadboard, which allowed you to kind of build wires without solder. Um, but now, so that's more convenient than the soldering thing, right? But now we're like, hey, I have hardware stuff that I want to run. And what does that mean? It means, well, I have a switch over here that I want to be able to push. And I have a light over here that I want to come on sometimes. Those are actual physical pieces of hardware that you're, you can't remove from the situation. You can't replace the light with software, right? At some point, you're going to have a physical thing 
We can't just completely replace our computer with software. I mean, at some point we're like, okay, I have a monitor that I want crap to show up on. All right, so this is hardware. <laughs> at some point that guy's got to be involved. We want as much stuff in software between the hardware as we can because it allows us to more flexibly change things. Make sense? How many of you have heard the word firmware before? Okay, if you have like a, a router or something like that, it's like, you know, there is a firmware upgrade for this, blah, blah, blah. What is firmware? All right, I love these words. Right back to my buzzwords of... Simplified OS, I guess, is a way I would define it. It's just basically something that runs an application so you set firmware for the modem and the software that tells the modem how to do a modem. Okay. Is it fair to say that firmware is the software in a um, programmable microcontroller? We just use this example of having a programmable microcontroller that has software in the middle and has generalistic inputs in either side. That allows us to kind of turn this single device like an Arduino. Let me, let me for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, let me just show you a picture of one real quick. Arduino. Yeah, so like this guy. So we have inputs on one side, we have outputs on another side, but you hook this guy into your computer through USB and you can write software and it gets stored on this little chip right here. Okay? So anything that runs through here, before it goes out here, I'm not sure which one is the input and output, but whatever, um, it's going to flow through this program that runs here. Okay? Now, this is general. This is a, you know, we have a general high-level programming language for this. I think Arduino uses a C++ derivative. It's like a, uh, basically it's, it supports everything in C++, but since there's, you know, you're kind of mimicking AND gates and OR gates and things like that, it kind of has some Arduino-esque syntax for, for doing some of those things. But ultimately, instead of wires living between these two sides that we would write, you know, that we would put the, you know, solder on there or have, you know, on a breadboard or something, all of our logic that lives between our inputs and outputs lives in this little program right here. And we load that program on through USB when we hook it to our computer. Okay, so we hook the Arduino to our computer, it gives us a little text editor, we type stuff in, we deploy it to our Arduino, it saves it right here, then we can go and test it. We test that software circuit we just built. If it doesn't work, we don't have to melt off uh, solder. We don't have to start pulling wires out of uh, breadboards. All we do is make a change to our software, it's saved, deploy it back to the Arduino. Done. This is firmware, okay? Now, in this example, this would be generalistic firmware for a generalistic circuit, okay? So we have a whole bunch of inputs and a whole bunch of outputs, of which for most projects, you're maybe using a couple of the inputs and a couple of the outputs, all right? That's why they give you so many of them so you can do all sorts of different projects uh, with those inputs and outputs. In an example, like a, uh, you know, a router, or something like that that might have a firmware update. That's going to be more of a domain specific circuit. Okay, it's going to be a circuit for sp specifically for doing the routing stuff. Okay, for, you know, moving network bits from or network bytes from here to here. Okay? It's going to be more complex than probably the are you cheating at the Wii circuit that we talked about earlier, but less complex than something like this which really has that, that really has infinite complexity associated with it. Well, infinite in terms of the per number of permutations of inputs and outputs you could have since we have a finite number of inputs and outputs. But, you know, we have a lot of flexibility with something like an Arduino. So we can take this one tool and build all sorts of different projects. But firmware is the software that lives in this integrated circuit. Make sense? Then it's programmable integrated circuit. So when there's a bug in your Linksys router, they can do a firmware update, which upgrades the software upgrades the software on this chip, rather than them having to send some guy out to your house with a soldering iron who's going to open up your thirty dollar router and start putting wires on there. Okay, that wouldn't work out that well, would it? 
That's why firmware exists. By definition, do you think firmware is faster or slower? Slower. Yeah, I mean, in the big scheme of things, from a human perspective, it's fast. But it should be far slower than direct hardware. Because we're, we're interjecting logic. It's not just as fast as electricity flows, right? It's, now it's as fast as electricity flows into my piece of software that has to run through this virtual machine is going to make all these decisions and then ultimately spit out, spill electricity out on the other side uh, in whatever way my logic said it should. So we're, we're majorly slowing down. Okay, if we want to put it like in a very accurate... Uh, how many of you watched the Olympics? Okay, what about the, you watch the running? See the, the, what is the Jamaican team won the... Is the 400 meter relay? All right, so here's the deal. I'm running the third leg. Okay. I'm this guy. All right. Now, the good news is I have Usain Bolt after me. So he's going to be able to make up some the ground that I lose. All right. But you have two fast runners. All these little circuits here are getting us to this point very quickly. Then I get the baton, okay, and I'm going at ramming speed. Okay, I think I run maybe fast. Maybe I run what six miles an hour? So it's like I start rolling. Okay, so I'm running slower than Usain Bolt. And we actually had a conversation the other day with the well during the when the Olympics was on about how big of a head start I would need. To not to, to beat Usain Bolt in the 100, 100 meter. How close to the finish? Meters. Yeah, yeah, we we were we were really debating. Did you come up with a hard number? Well, I mean, we were still like kind of guessing, but um, uh, he thought that I would have to have like a like a I think he said like a forty meter or a fifty meter lead. So basically, I would start the race at the halfway point. But to me, that feels like I'd still lose. I know. I, I, <laughs> You know what I mean? He'd come up on you pretty fast. We, yeah, but he's a slow starter. He is. Yeah, apparently Usain Bolt's like one of the slowest guys off the blocks. And then he just turns into a blur. And then he starts smiling at people at the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, I, I think that that's a, it is funny, but it is a kind of a realistic example for this. I would be that slowdown part, Okay. We're still going to get across the finish line. And with Usain Bolt backing me up, we might even win. I probably wouldn't win at the Olympic level, but maybe like at a high school level. I mean, I think that the Jamaican running team with me in the middle might still win a high school race. I mean, they're probably fast enough without me. That So, yeah, we're, so we're just we're hypotheticals, obviously, but you don't have to make fun of my foot speed. It's incredibly mediocre. It's a funny quote from, how many of you saw the movie, um, uh, what was the, what was the Bugs Bunny, Michael Jordan, Space Jam, yeah, Space Jam, remember Newman from, uh, what was Newman's famous quote in uh, Space Jam, when he tried to get Michael to put him, take, put him in off the bench, he said, Michael, put me in, I'm not just fat, I'm, I'm slow. <laughs> like major selling point, right? It's like, look, I'm not just fat. I'm, I'm also slow. <laughs> Put me in. We're good to go. All right, so in any case, um, when you have a programmable logic board, firmware, as we're going to call those synonyms, right? Um, you're, by nature, slowing things down. Now, is that always okay? Probably not, right? There's going to be some very specialized things where you want native circuits. You want electricity through and through. And those are going to be expensive, right? You know, just think about the, the, the prototyping that we would have had to go through. You know, we just thought about like we're, we're debugging our circuit here and oops, we have a problem in our quote program. You know, our circuit, we can say the algorithm to build the circuits, the same thing as our software to write to, to build a program. Well, we have a bug in our circuit. If we're writing that in software, that takes us two seconds to fix if you have your next thing to try. 
Well, think about your homework assignments when you're working on them in, your pro in the programming classes. Okay, when you um, run into a bug, you have something that's not working with your software you're trying to fix. And let's say after about two hours of staring at it, how many different things have you tried? 15, 20 different things? Maybe it's five different things, depending on how far down the rabbit hole you had to go with them until you determined that this wasn't a good choice. Okay, But you explore lots of different things, and it's convenient in software. So let's take us back to the hardware world. And let's say we're doing this with a soldering iron. You have a bug in your circuit. Now you're going to try attempt number two. You have to get the solder off, run new wires, make sure they're not touching each other because now you have a different level of things that can interfere. It's not just, is my logic right? Is, is my logic accurate? Is it, does it accurately represent what I think it does? Maybe you have too much solder in one place that's actually making two wires touch that you didn't intend. Okay, there's all sorts of little things that can go wrong with an integrated circuit um, it, when humans are involved. So now we have the, you know, the ability to print integrated circuits, so we're a little bit clearer there, and we can prototype them in software. So it allows us to make all of our mistakes before we actually put it onto, you know, get the solder, the solder gun out and actually start putting things together. So it becomes a very interesting world, but um, think about how uh, frustrating you've, it's been for you in the past when you're debugging a computer program for two or three hours. Now imagine that you have a hot solder gun in your hand with melted, molten metal. Things can get dangerous quick, <laughs> right? You start getting angry, you start throwing stuff. Have you, ever, have you ever tried to stab somebody with a soldering iron? I mean, they're sharp. Yeah, why do they have to be so sharp? I never understood that. I think it's just so you have the granular point. Yeah. But especially now that I have my tremors, I mean, I'm just all over the place. I barely can hit the board, let alone like the one spot on the board. Yeah, it's just out of that business. So in any case, do we kind of have an appreciation for how these circuits kind of work now? And the purpose of firmware? So firmware is the software that exists within a programmable integrated circuit. All right, so it's kind of our, our uh, um, shortcut, our cheating of the integrated circuits. Because most integrated circuits don't need the full speed of electricity from an end user perspective, right? Like I know we expect super high performance from our network, but uh, our data speeds aren't quite at the same level as the speed of electricity, right? We're at least two or three megabits slower than that currently. <laughs> so how, how fast is electricity? There's some resistance. Just below, just below the speed of light. Yeah, I mean, there's resistance involved, but it's not unfair to say basically the speed of light, right? It's not unfair to say that. Every wire has some level of resistance in it. We're not going to get into that in here. That's more of a physics, physics thing, but, you know, fast, <laughs> okay, really fast, um, way faster than our internet connection speeds will ever be. Well, well, maybe we should never say ever, but then it probably needs to be, <laughs> you know, especially when you consider that, you know, uh, when you think about modern internet connections, uh, when, when any of you have a, what's the fastest internet connection speed any of us have? Anybody have 100 megabits per second? Huh? No, Google has a one gigabit connection. And AT&T is going to have one gigabit, gigabit here. Yep, in Milwaukee, this coming, this year. How much? Disgusting amount? I don't know. But, so, so what's the fastest we have in here? Anybody have 50? 15? Oh, yeah, 50. Okay, yeah, so so 50 megabits per second. Now, how often do you think you can download? Well, first of all, how fast is 50 megabits per second? We'll uh, dabble into the number conversion stuff a little bit better. Megabits, small b. 
50 divided by 8. So that's 6.25 megabytes per second. That's theoretical maximum download speed is 6.25 megabytes every second. How many, and now our download speed on our internet connections is somebody else's upload speed, right? We can only download as fast as whoever we're downloading from can upload to us. Okay, well that's why I get paid the big bucks. <laughs> okay, so we can only download stuff as fast as somebody else can upload it to us, right? How often do you think a, uh, a site you go to can give you stuff at six megabytes per second? Very, very rarely, right? Um, only maybe places like Apple or Google have the bandwidth that, they, that you might be able to pull that. Um, but I'm going to suspect that most of you ethical computing gurus out there have probably seen speeds like this before. When have you seen speeds like this before? When have you ever gotten the six or five megabytes per second? <laughs> huh? When? When have, you, when have you actually seen it? Give me an example of an application that you might use your uh, computer for where you might actually maximize your internet connection speed. BitTorrent. Yeah. For completely legitimate Now why? Why would BitTorrent support that? Huh? You're not downloading it from a server, you're downloading it from like other people's computers and just accessing Yeah, well forget about the word server there. Sure. You're not downloading it from one source. Sure. You're downloading it from a whole bunch of sources at once. Each of those sources is giving it to you at 50 kilobytes a second, 120 kilobytes a second, whatever. And all of that adds up to six megabytes per second. Make sense? So, but if a majority of the time we don't need things like BitTorrent, you know, we're only using those for experimental stealing movies. All right. Um, or Donald Trump campaign stuff. Yeah, that kind of, that kind of, is he still, he's still our guy? Oh, yeah. All right, we're good. All right. So, um, what time is this class over? Uh, four minutes. Okay, we're good. We're good. I got plenty of time. All right. So in any case, um, so most of the time we're not going to be able to download anywhere near six megabytes per second. So why do we need a 50 megabit per second internet connection? Are we just wasting our money? Is it all just to show off to your friends? Like, yeah, I have one gigabit. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so we take one gigabit, that's 1,024 megabit, divided by eight, that's 128 megabytes per second. Good for you. <laughs> I have 10 megabit and I tie you <laughs> in almost every single application. So is it just showing off or is there actually a, a need for uh, that faster connection? Okay, well, what would you use that more bandwidth for? So how many of you are at home and you are playing a video game on your computer while watching Netflix in the background um, while downloading a movie in the other room? <laughs> so each one of those individual applications is going to be using a portion of your bandwidth, right? All right, so... Sometimes it's not about maximum speed for a single application. It's speed across multiple applications. Okay, so we want to start thinking about some of these trade-offs in computing. And we're going to do a lot of that in this course. Um, so we're talking about this in terms of internet speed because that's relevant to all of us. So kind of pulling that back towards what we were talking about uh, leading up to that. When we have an integrated circuit, especially when we consider that we believe that Software is, from a human being's perspective, software is fast, right? Even a, something running in the Java virtual machine, which is, you know, a middleman to the middleman, it, it still feels fast to a person, okay? We know it's way slower than the speed of light, but we're not going to notice that, right? How many of you could tell the difference between the speed of light and half of the speed of light? <laughs> okay. How many of you could tell the difference between the speed of light and a hundredth of the speed of light? None of us, right? 
Okay? None of us can tell the difference. I mean, it's not humanly perceptible. All right. So with that in mind, okay, with that in mind, how do we measure when do we need a faster connection versus when don't we need a faster connection? Does that make sense? No, no, no. Forget about the upload. I'm talking about hardware. Hardware. When is it okay to have that software circuit in the middle versus having everything be hardware through and through? Probably most of the time, software's fine. We're not going to notice. We take that uh, router as an example. Since our internet connection speed is coming nowhere near the speed of light, okay, we have wiggle room in terms of time. Large swaths of wiggle room. So we can afford making it firmware and having software slow down in the middle at the trade-off of being able to update that piece of, uh, um, you know, it, it, we call it a piece of hardware, but really it's kind of a hardware-software hybrid, right? Your Linksys router is not all hardware. There's a software component to that. In fact, we integrate, we, we interface with it through a website. And that's all software, right? And that's talking to the firmware, which is the updating variables and stuff on there. I mean, when you when you update something on that little website and hit save, you don't hear something soldering inside the machine. So updating. All right. So for um, Thursday, I want you to look at chapter one. Well, not really chapter one. Let me just scroll up here. Yeah, the very the introduction, the the this introduction thing from our uh, so assembly introduction. Read through all this, understand this, and you will very 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 likely have a quiz at beginning class on Thursday dealing with this. Sound good? All right, I will see everybody on Thursday.